Okay, we're calling this meeting to order. I'll remind all counselors and people that this is to be in live stream. Um, anyway, we'll start with, and those who are willing or can stand, we'll have a moment of reflection. Thank you. Okay. You can uh, disclose any pecuniary interest at this point in time or any point in time through the meeting. Um, and I need a motion to confirm the agenda. But before I ask for that, we're going to have one additional item for the closed session regarding an identifiable individual. So if I could have a motion to move by Bob Wilhelm, second by you, McDermott. Those in favor, it's carried. And we move on to consent agenda. We have items 5.1 to 5.13. Does anyone want to see anything removed, discussed? Not seeing any hands in here on the screen. I have a motion that council receives the consent agenda items 5.1 to 5.13 and approves the October 15, 2020 council minutes. Moved by Doug Kellum, Bob Wilhelm. Those in favor? That's carried. Okay. Moving on again, turn the page and we start with public meetings, hearings and delegations. We have none. We're then gonna move into staff reports. And the first item on the agenda is uh, performance appraisal update. And I know it says CAO, but I'm assuming yes. Tyler. So through the warning, we do have the, the delegation piece for 7.2.1, uh, we can bring, uh, them in now if, if you want them to speak oh, on. Do they actually want to present as a delegation or be here for questions? It, they're, they're here for questions. If you want to bring them in for the planning piece, we can do well, They can come in now. Well, actually, let's wait till after we get the... Yeah, Mary is here. So we're going we're gonna to do the uh, performance appraisal first, and then I will mention that when we get to 7.2.1. Sure. I just emailed her. She's up. Okay. So we just need to get Sally on the screen here. Mary. Or Mary, what am I saying? Please. Sally's not here because I'm still thinking of that planning thing. I think Mary is here. Is email to come in? So what Tyler was referring to is we do have uh, an individual here from the planning consulting firm that uh, is with regards to 7.2.1. And he's gonna be available for questions because Sally is absent today. We're just waiting for a body. I didn't think they were going to be this quick. No. <laughs> How's everybody's internet working? Is it a little slow in here today? Yeah, mine's really slow. Yeah, so is mine. So is mine. I'm hooked, but it's just incredible. Did everybody read that thing from Enbridge in full detail? Nope. Oh my God. Did you have five hours? Uh, well, then if you actually look through the numbers, they were showing the numbers for the different zones. Yeah. But they were all the same, yeah. except for two. And I couldn't quite figure that out. What they're preparing you for is a big increase. Huge. Just so you're aware. Um, I didn't go over the ground rules, but sure do we have them by now. Well, I'm waiting for Marion to show up. Leave your seat mask on. Um, make sure you fill your form out, turn it in. And here comes Marion in the side door. 
Good morning, Marion. Yeah, morning. Morning, right. so you're up. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry. I was at the current house first. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, through the warden, uh, the warden council. So, with regards to the performance evaluation system, this is something that we've been talking about for um, probably about a year now since I started with regards to. Yeah, take this off so you can hear me. Sorry. <laughs> um, Uh, so with the performance evaluation system, this is something that has been asked for an, an update. Our performance values evaluation system hasn't been updated in several years. And so what we've done is we've created templates for um, major groups of employees. So we have one for senior management teams. So those would be people who regularly present to council and report to the CAO. What's included in this um, performance evaluation is um, the CAO would go, CAO would go through um, a, an evaluation, not just of performance, but also how the employee measures against our values, as well um, how they interact and uh, work with council. So that's the major difference with um, the leadership uh, portfolio. We do have a, a, again, another individual performance evaluation for managers. So this is a little bit different. So this is people who have um, people reporting to them. So any type of staff report, they would not be um, a regular at council. So that's why we developed this specific plan that really looks at how they manage and get the work done. And then we have a staff uh, a performance evaluation which is, again, a little bit of a, of a lighter weight. It allows a manager and staff member to discuss their goals and performance that they're going to achieve throughout the year. And then lastly, we have a, a public works uh, template, which really just is more of how did someone complete their tasks? Is it being done in a timely manner? Um, you know, the way in which the tasks are done and prioritized, are they uh, you know, completing them in a safe and efficient manner, et cetera. So we've really worked to gear it towards our target staff members in ways that really make sense. We've been testing them um, with our employees as well, and we've had a really positive response. And um, lastly, we've actually brought them to West Perth as well, who is adopting and using them as their templates um, starting in the new year. So um, paramedics for both uh, TV and Teamsters, those templates are not included yet. We are going to be working with uh, the union just to, there is a, a component to when they get to their step increases, but everything is through the collective agreement. So that's why those two templates are not included uh, at this point in time, but that would be an agreement uh, with the union. So. Um, I'll take any questions. Uh, I will say this process is geared to start with the calendar year, effective January 1st. And so a uh, senior management team is going to be taking the first crack at uh, crafting their goals at our next uh, um, management team meeting. So I think that will be great. So uh, all the senior leaders will have their performance plans so that way for the next year, which will be able to cascade throughout the organization. Okay. Questions for Marion. Todd. Thanks, Marion. Um, uh, a, a massive amount of work there. Appreciate um, uh, what is happening. That's uh, very exciting. Could you explain to me how um, the corporation's strategic plan will be leveraged in helping employees set their objectives for a year and, and in serving as the basis for evaluation? Definitely. So um, if you'll notice on the first page of the senior leader template, we actually have um, for, for senior management team to insert the strategic plan goals that they are applicable for. And then from there, they're going to create their goals that cascade and link to those strategic plan goals and set them for the year. Uh, the hope is from that, uh, it will drive down to their appropriate managers and staff base. So we should be able to see a full cascading effect in terms of as a staff member, I can see exactly what my manager is doing and how that aligns to the strategic plan. And that's something that we are going to do. Um, HR has developed a training plan. So when we work through it with senior management team next week, we're also going to have a PowerPoint as well that um, they can bring back to their managers and also for their staff. This is why we're doing it. And this is why it's so important. Todd? Just one more, um, and maybe this is a little too tactical, but um, you did seem to suggest that uh, with the cascade that, that you're building, which is a wonderful idea, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, line visibility from top to bottom in the organization. Can you comment on how you intend to make that happen? 
Yes, definitely. So um, again, the first starting point is actually next week when we discuss and also set some common uh, senior management goals as well. We know right now customer service is of utmost importance. So I foresee each of our senior leadership team, when we're discussing our goals, we're putting customer service first. And then how can we link um, our regular daily activities to the goal of improved customer service throughout the county? Um, when we look at the strategic plan goals, we're doing the same thing. So we have our values, we have our uh, what we need to achieve over the next three years and sort of chunk it out into pieces for the calendar year. So um, each time when we, when we start to develop and build our SMART goals, they're not just, you know, points or, um, you know, aimless targets. No, these are actual goals that have a realistic, time-based, measurable um, outcome. So that way throughout the year, you know, either for an employee's probationary period of six months, you can look back and just be like, how are we doing? Um, are we on track to achieve these targets? Where are we? And then from there, either adjust course, maybe uh, change the, the, the goal to make it more realistic, or at least report back to council, say, look, we're not going to meet this Goal, which is endangering our strategic plan. So um, objectives. So it, it just has a lot of checkpoints and balances that I think uh, will help us really um, guide and temper our staff into, you know, here's, this is exactly what we're aiming for, and this is how we're going to get there. <clears throat> Other questions? Yeah, I liked it. Just making sure here, it takes a little longer. I don't see any hands. Thank you, Marion. Excellent report. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. So I do have a motion here, and I just want to just clarify one thing, because we are changing around the performance appraisal review. Mm -hmm. So my motion says, Perth County Council receives a performance appraisal update report for information. Do we also need to approve that? Uh, a policy. Yeah, yeah. Through, through the word, I would add to that, and direct staff to update the policy. Okay, so I'm going to change the wording I have here that says Perth County Council receives the performance appraisal update to part the information and has staff update the policy information. Right. Yeah. Anybody have an issue with that? Do I have a mover and a seconder? Todd Kassenberg moves and Matt Duncan seconds. So any any Last chance for questions. Those in favor, it's carried. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll probably see you later. Yes. Okay. Um, we are now moving on. And we get to the planning portion, 7.2.1. And if we could add. Our individual there, Andrew Hurd. We have David. There's Andrew. Is it Head or Hurd? Oh, Head. Andrew Head. Sorry, my mistake. Okay, so uh, Sally has written this report. She's unavailable. So, David, are you taking over at this point in time? Uh, that is correct, uh, Warden Aitchison. You're up. Okay, uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, Warden, members of council, uh, following a report that's been prepared by our manager of planning uh, concerns a modification to a draft plan of subdivision uh, in the township of Perth East uh, by WMJ Geese Construction Limited. Uh, the proposed modification applies to uh, draft plan of subdivision file uh, PE 1401. Uh, the original draft plan was approved uh, July 15th, 2014 by county council and uh, subsequently was uh, um, subject to a um, uh, extension of approval in 2019. Uh, essentially, the uh, proposed modifications to the existing draft plan incorporate four uh, separate um, uh, modifications, uh, all, all that the uh, uh, planning office has deemed to be minor in nature. Uh, the first is an introduction of a walkway block uh, to provide additional um, pedestrian connectivity uh, to a nearby trail for the development. Uh, this would uh, propose the introduction of a new block, Block 72, uh, which would, um, which would um, uh, provide a connection for this pedestrian walkway. The second modification uh, proposed is renumbering of two existing blocks as future development blocks. Um, 
this would, uh, these blocks represent uh, development reserves at the southern portion of the development uh, for future extensions of Cobalt Street and Coulter Street uh, that were originally shown on the draft plan as blocks B and C. This is really just an administrative change to uh, rename them as blocks 75 and 76 respectively. Um, and that uh, the intention in the future would be that these blocks would be conveyed to the township of Perth, Perth East uh, to hold until any future development on adjacent lands uh, proceeds. Uh, the third change is the introduction of semi-detached units to the development. Uh, so the, re the proposed revisions uh, would see um, uh, 12 uh, existing lots uh, that were previously earmarked for single detached dwellings uh, to now uh, be directed for construction of semi-detached dwellings. So there'd be a total increase of 12 additional units for, for the development. This would affect lots 19 to 24 and lots 29 to 34 uh, on, on the draft plan. Uh, and these units would um, front onto the southern side of uh, an extension of Pug Street, uh, which would um, um, extend into the development. The last modification is uh, proposed here is the introduction of blocks for drainage control. Uh, there's um, uh, two, uh, was found to be two existing single detached uh, dwellings at uh, 15 and 16 Jolene Court uh, that are located adjacent to the, uh, the draft plan of subdivision that have been experiencing uh, negative uh, drainage impacts. Uh, the addition of these two blocks for drainage control would alleviate um, uh, these offsite impacts uh, for drainage onto adjacent lots. Uh, concern was raised by neighbors that live on Jolene Court uh, that there was existing unsatisfactory drainage that affected their properties. Uh, a meeting was arranged between planning staff and the neighbors uh, as well uh, to review a stormwater management plan uh, that was provided by engineering staff from BM Ross Limited. Um, essentially, uh, the, um, uh, the um, included uh, uh, drainage measures uh, would ensure that the post-development drainage uh, contributing to stormwater onto Jolene Court would be reduced to 11% of the pre-development uh, impact, as well as uh, uh, ensuring that there'd be reduced runoff rates post-development. Uh, planning staff, uh, in our reporting, we can confirm that a written agreement between the developer and the abutting landowners on Jolene Court has been signed uh, to accept uh, these measures for additional drainage control. Uh, that is the summary of the four changes uh, that are proposed through this modification to the existing draft plan of subdivision, uh, file for PE 1401. Uh, we are recommending that County Council accept our report concerning the draft plan modifications for information and that County Council uh, approve the proposed modifications to the draft plan of subdivision as duly noted. Um, thank you for your time Council and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, concerning the staff report uh, uh, that's before you today. Okay. Any questions for now? We do have Andrew Head here. Technically, he's not allowed to uh, participate in that, but because of Sally's absence, he's here to answer any questions that anyone might have pertaining to this. Um, do I have any questions for either David or Andrew with regards to this agenda item? Don't see any. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, I have a motion, county that the council of the county of Perth receives report titled "Proposed Modification to Draft Plan Approval of Subdivision File Number PE 14-01 for William J. Geese Construction Limited for information, and that the council of the county of Perth approve the proposed modification to the draft plan approval of subdivision." Number PE 14-01 by William J. Geese Construction Limited, located at part lot nine, concession three, formerly in Mornington Township, now in the Milverton Ward, Perth East, be approved, subject to the amended conditions as attached. <laughs> Do I have a mover? Ron Agat, second by you, McDermott. Any questions or comments? Those in favor, it's approved. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, even though we didn't really need you. Thanks, David. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Public Works, John. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, just want to take the opportunity first off to introduce uh, Bill Wilson. He's our asset management and engineering specialist. The bill started a couple of weeks ago and has just jumped right into things here. So Bill has spent the last 11 years at the Township of Perth East as their operations coordinator. And over the years, Bill and I have worked on several joint projects uh, with the county and he has a very good understanding of our operations, our programs and certainly our asset software. Uh, he really hits the ground running and uh, has certainly made, made the job of orientation and getting them up to speed all that much easier for me. Uh, Bill is also the current president of the Association of Ontario Road Supervisors and our local roads association. And through that role, he brings a wealth of industry best practices, a lot of great uh, networking contacts, and certainly some leadership abilities. I'm very excited to have Bill on board, and I know through this role, he'll be a huge benefit to our department and certainly our corporation as this uh, role really aligns very well with our strategic plan and being good stewards of managing our road assets. So uh, Bill, Bill's already uh, uh, done a few reports for me and we're just gonna throw him right into the fire here. So I welcome Bill Wilson and he'll be presenting our first report. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Warren Aitchison and members of council. I'm happy to be here, happy to meet all of you, some, some familiar faces. Uh, anyways, I will get started here um, with this report regarding uh, pre-budget approval request for the replacement of uh, vehicle 29, which is a 2007 uh, tandem, ax tandem axle snowplow. Um, we are seeking pre-budget approval for this purchase um, with the intent of uh, issuing a joint tender with, uh, with West Perth as well as Perth South for that replacement. Um, they're looking at similar items. Um, we've done that in the past um, and it's, it's, it's worked out well um, in our favor. As well as the plow equipment, which we are looking to sole source um, that through Viking Surveys. Um, they are the bodybuilder that has uh, done all the, the equipment fleet, the box and the, the plow equipment. Um, I think that's all I have to, to comment on this report. Um, if approved, we would certainly um, bring back the results of the, the tender as well as the quotations provided from Viking to Council for uh, further approval. So if there's any questions, I'm here to answer them. Okay, thanks, uh, Bill. Welcome aboard. And I have a question from Mayor Wilhelm. Um, I guess my question is on single source from Viking. Uh, is there not another uh, manufacturer uh, to compare pricing because you're looking probably close to $150,000 for the body. And I think you should be looking at uh, other uh, sources and, and just to keep Viking online. The, um, through you, Warden, the other, the other bodybuilder that I'm aware of is La Rochelle. Um, they are uh, Eastern Ontario, Quebec. Um, company and in the past we have we have issued tenders for and i guess I'm, I'm speaking from my previous experience and they um they did not um provide any um, response to the tenders that were put out and also the the equipment and the location of, of viking um our mechanics and uh operators are all very familiar with the with the equipment and the setup um that viking provides and they're, they're located in Mount Forest, which makes it um, very easy to, uh, to get parts um, in the event of an emergency or a breakdown. John? Thank you, Warden. Uh, maybe further to that, uh, uh, as the, the entire county fleet and as well as uh, our lower tier fleet 
are pretty much all um, the box and snowplow equipment is from Viking. Um, so we're, you know, with that, uh, it's, it's very beneficial uh, to, to sort, sole source that and as well. This is in keeping with the last time we went out the joint tender where the chassis tendered out and the uh, box and snowplow equipment is sole sourced uh, through through Viking. Uh, that was previously done by West Perth in 2019. Um, along with that, uh, previous tenders that have been done, whenever we go out, whether we're tendering it separately and or having just one tender through the, the chassis builder, um, they always, their pricing always is included with a bid from Viking Seat. So it's, uh, um, th this is the way to go here just for the, uh, consistency with our with our fleets. Other questions? Daryl? Yeah, thanks there. Um, so what you're saying there, John, is essentially is the, the, <clears throat> they like dealing with Viking, prefer to deal with that with the package right to us. You see. Yeah, for you, Warden Atchison, that's, that's correct. Typically all the dealers around here, when they go to get pricing for the box or plow equipment, uh, their go-to is, is Viking. Um, there we've, in the past, uh, we have had another bodybuilder do some of that. It's been um, probably in the order of 12 to 13 years since uh, that they were last in, in the market doing that kind of work. Um, we have had no issues uh, with Viking and you know and, and any and any problems are, are very quickly uh, rectified uh, that being said because of the nature of their business and because they are one of the only ones providing that they are very busy and this is why we are out to early to to get pre-tender approval because of the time frame that this uh, takes to get so uh the takes time to get the chassis and then that needs to get to the bodybuilder. And from there, the, the whole process is, it's about a year and a half. So we're just hopeful that we can get this in and, and get this in our fleet, uh, hopefully by next winter season. Other questions or comments? Just gonna quick comment. I know exactly why Councillor Wilhelm asked that question. It was a big report released on Monday afternoon with regards to sole, like one single source for uh, procurement. And it referred to the city of Collingwood and there was millions of dollars wasted. And now with the transparency and everything, uh, they're gonna be looking very close at uh, municipalities who are single sourcing for procurement. But that's why I'm sure why you asked that question. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, everyone, every municipality is going to be under the spotlight now. Okay. There's no more questions or comments. I have a motion that Perth County Council receives a pre-budget approval slash tandem plow truck replacement report for information and that Perth County Council authorize pre-budget approval to initiate the capital procurement process for the replacement of V029 tandem axle cab and chassis, and that Perth County Council authorized pre budget approval to initiate the capital procurement process for the replacement of the V029 plow equipment through a single source purchase from Viking Sims Limited. Moved by Councillor Callum, seconded by Councillor Eight. Do I have any questions or comments? This one's on our replacement schedule anyway, right, John? Okay. Those in favor? <coughs> carried. Thank you. Seems you got the most of the reports today, John. Keep going. Thank you, Gordon Hitchison. Uh, next report uh, should be the always stop at Perth Line 26 and Perth Road 113. Uh, last year in the summer, 
Um, there was an all-way stop that was created at the intersection of Perth Line 26 and Perth Road 113. And that was done for safety reasons when the MTO did the construction work at, uh, at Perth Line 26 and Highway 7 for the roundabout. Um, Perth Road 113 was used as a detour route and for safety purposes, we asked them to install and always stop there. Uh, that was very effective during the course of that construction. And we decided to leave that in place while we did uh, reconstructed Perth Road 113 and Perth Road 112, Perth South Line 20 and Perth East Line 29 this summer. Uh, these projects are now complete and, and now we must face the decision whether to re remove or retain the all-way stop controls at this intersection. Uh, Perth Line 26 has always been a through highway right from Highway 7 to the town of Tavistock. Uh, Perth Road 113 did have the stop controls at the intersection. Uh, previous to this, uh, there have been a number of reported accidents at this intersection over the years. Um, however, that average occurring this year did not meet the high accident frequency threshold as prescribed in the Ontario Traffic Manual Always Stop Warrant. I've listed in the report the volume of traffic uh, here and on Perth Line 26, there's 5,270 vehicles per day and on Perth Road 113, 3,975 vehicles per day. This makes this one of the busiest intersections in the county road network. And although this intersection does not meet the always stop warrant, uh, the volume split does fall within the appropriate range. Um, <clears throat> so we only have uh, minor work left to be completed on Perth Road 113. And uh, this always stop has been in place for approximately 18 months. And we did contact uh, the Stratford Police, uh, not only last year, but again this year, just to inquire about accident history at this intersection. And to date, uh, since that always stop has been in place, there have been no reported accidents at the intersection. And as well, we have not received any credible complaints about the always stop. In, in fact, uh, we've received a number of, uh, of, of good responses positive responses with that in place. Uh, there is only one approved always stop within the county road network, and this is in the village of Amory. That was designated in 2006. And as well, that intersection did not meet the always, Ontario traffic manual always stop warrant, but it did have a significant accident. And based on sound engineering practices, staff recommended the installation of the always stop there, which was approved by council. Since that installation, there has been a dramatic increase in accidents and definitely severity of accidents. So the always stop at uh, Perth Line 26 and 113 has been operating effectively since being installed as a safety measure. And while that intersection does not meet the criteria um, set out in the always stop warrant, the volume split is at an appropriate level for which one we, where we would consider one. Uh, given that recent an annexation and the potential industrial development out at the southwest end of Stratford, uh, we expect that that will put a, a lot more volume of traffic and, and potentially truck traffic on Perth Road 113. Um, we expect that that uh, future, future traffic volume will even go further to equalize the traffic volumes at each leg of that intersection. So what staff is recommending based on the current and future volume splits, 18 months of operational effectiveness and consultation with the police on the accident history to keep in place the always stop at Perth Line 26 and Perth Road 113. In order to do that, uh, we need to amend bylaw 2956, which is designating through highways. And that is uh, before you today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, do I have any questions for John? Bob? Uh, more comment. Um, I know the neighbors certainly in the area, most of them certainly appreciate it and uh, um, 
particular, my concern is that are we setting a precedent and we do not, if we're not gonna stick to our roads uh, management and, and how we calculate stops, uh, I would suggest that we have a number of other intersections that maybe should be four-way stops too. And uh, as you indicated, it's a straight through shot from seven to Tavistock um, with trucks. And this is a high traffic truck area. Uh, it's certainly not good for climate uh, with uh, stopping trucks and starting them up again. However, I would support your recommendation. Councilor Hardy? Yeah, if I may, I mean, <laughs> I'm familiar with the trucking industry too. It's not fun, it's not nice, it's hard on trucks. All these roundabouts and stops, it's at an expense, but at the end of the day, they're, the accidents at some of these intersections on, are unarguably severe. Uh, Bob alluded there, we need to look at some other intersections and I, I'm thinking, what are we doing here? There's some up in West Perth, we know where they are, they're nasty. The, the accidents are huge, the fatalities are awful. Is this something that we're gonna start looking at? Are, are we gonna step outside of what the province recommends and take this on our own? Are we eventually gonna get our fingers slapped? I don't know. Uh, look, a little comment there maybe, John. <laughs> John? Three, three, Warden Atchison. Uh, yes, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I've spoke before on uh, some some different topics. Uh, last council, the one last council meeting was uh, Perth Road 140, Perth Line 91, and also Perth Line 44, <coughs> Perth Road 135. Uh, we do know that, that this is becoming an issue within the county. Um, and, and we know as well through, through the asset assumption process and to the, the idea of a county road network is to have a lot of through traffic and to transport goods and materials. And, and so when we, when we recommend an always stop, it's, it's something that we don't, you know, we don't take lightly. Um, uh, it's, however, it, it, in all likelihood, if we looked at any intersection within Perth County, um, and that would include the MTO intersections as well on the highways, it's, it's highly unlikely that any of these intersections would need an always stop warrant under the Ontario Traffic Manual Guidelines. And I think the last council meeting I was suggesting is, you know, we need to take a further look, number one, at our, our accident history and where where are fatalities occurring and come back to council with some ideas on how we can better handle that moving forward. Um, I, I certainly have the same concerns that Council, Councillor Wilhelm um, said here and are we setting a precedent and you know we're, we're not intending that every intersection be an always stop. Um, however, I think we need to certainly look at the criteria and maybe set something. So that I do, uh, now that we've got uh, Bill, Bill Wilson on, on board here, that is something that we are looking at. Uh, we have reached out to the OPP and hope to be meeting with them very shortly to see what kind of information they can provide us in, in, in assisting us uh, with moving forward with some of these things. So, So thank you. Councilor uh, Wilhelm. Just an FYI, there at our last police service board meeting, uh, we spoke with the uh, Stratford police chief on the sand speed, uh, et cetera. And he's going to uh, put together a report and uh, I'd be happy to share that with you, John. And, and uh, hopefully he comes up with some ideas. I know he's gonna reach out to other areas and see if they had any ideas, but. I don't think we're the only uh, county that has issues with uh, severe accidents at intersections. Anyone else? Just a quick comment. Tuesday at our Perth South Council meeting, I mentioned that this was on the agenda for Thursday because it is in Perth South. I got nine emails, texts, and phone calls from Tuesday till last night 
all supporting this. And the number one thing there, everyone said was a reduced or lack of accidents and this is that. And this has over the years been traditionally a really bad intersection. There's been a lot of people met their demise at that corner. But I fully support leaving that in here. Um, the one thing too, you talk about truck traffic and I know Councillor Herlick sees a lot of the truck traffic go by his place. But if you're sitting out there at night or blowing snow in some of those places along 113, the truck traffic between Stratford and going down 113 towards Woodstock is phenomenal because all the feeder plants are getting filled up for the morning run at or emptied out for the morning run at Toyota. And I would think there'd be far more truck traffic on 113 than there is on Perth Line 26. And that does give, if everybody stops, gives those trucks a chance to get across the road. Safety is our ultimate goal here. We've had this discussion, John and I, and different people back since we've had a couple of really bad accidents in the county and we're doing our best, but you know, I have a saying, but I'm not sure I should say it right now, but uh, yeah, you can put all the stop signs and flashing lights in you want, but if people don't stop at them, there's not much we can do. But that's just kind of helps reduce the risk, I think. Anyway, having said that, I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the all way stop slash Perth Line 26 at Perth Road 113 report for information. And that Perth County Council designate the intersection of Perth Line 26 and Perth Road 113 as an all way stop by amending Schedule A of Bylaw 2956 designating true highways. Moved by Councillor Wilhelm, second by Councillor McDermott. Any more comments or questions? Those in favor? It's Gary. Thanks. Significant weather event, John. Thank you, Warren Peterson. Um, this report, uh, Bill had a, a good hand in, in writing this one here. Um, of course, uh, we met all the public works leads uh, at the county. The lower tiers in the town of St. Mary's met in, in October. And one of the things we discussed uh, in, in our meeting was the significant weather event. And this is a, a recent amendment to the minimum maintenance standards for municipal highways under the uh, Municipal Act. And this allows a municipality to declare a significant weather event based on uh, adverse and severity of a, of a snowstorm. Um, the, the county should assign delegated authority to its staff, uh, the appropriate staff members in order to enact this uh, section of, of the minimum maintenance standards. Uh, this just sort of aids us in, in our uh, winter efforts. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we discussed this at our meeting that this is just one tool that we can use. Uh, of course, that meeting revolved around a lot of COVID contingency plans. And I think it's fair to say that if COVID should impact any one of our operations, uh, that could have a significant uh, uh, effect and impact on, on our services, certain, certainly in the winter time. Um, this is one tool and it's you know, not directly related to COVID, but it is directly related to weather. And should we have, should we know that a significant storm is coming in, we can declare this significant weather event, which basically just gives us a reprieve from the minimal maintenance standards uh, until we can get out on the roadways and get them cleared up and, uh, and, and back working again. So, uh, by the county declaring a significant weather event doesn't necessarily mean that the local municipality has to declare one. Um, I think you'll be seeing in all your local uh, councils this, this matter coming forward and you'll be likely looking at, at this, doing a designation by law uh, of authority at your local municipality as well. So, all this is saying is that if the county declares a significant weather event, we think a, uh, either a portion or the whole county will be impacted by this winter event. And we suspect that the severity and duration of it may, may affect our ability to meet the minimum maintenance standards. Um, 
that doesn't mean if that local municipality feels that they are able to weather the storm, so to speak, and, and still meet those minimum standards, they do not have to necessarily declare that significant weather event based on the counties. Um, so we would obviously, in order to do this, we're, we just don't do this because we think this, we, that weather, we're getting reports from Environment Canada in our, in our weather services. We check that uh, three times daily and continually monitor that on an ongoing basis. So there is a lot of documentation that, that comes with this, and this is just not something that you uh, would, would, would do willy-nilly. Um, if there is any questions, uh, we're just seeking council approval to update the delegation of powers and duties to allow the director of public works and or their designate to declare a significant weather event. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for John or Bill. Bob. Um, I guess we all know that uh, we can have some challenges in the winter and it seems like number eight highway is a split. If you're north of number eight, sometimes it's terrible or you're south and sometimes it's terrible. But would the county, would you uh, be able to, I guess, split the county in half or does it have to be all uh, significant weather event? Um, through you, Warden Aitchison, yeah, if we're going to declare a significant weather event, it would be it would be county wide. Um, you're you're correct. I think you know early in the winter time, like November, December, when uh, with with the weather patterns, you typically see those snow squalls off of Lake Huron that will affect more you know towards the Strathroy, London area, and and hit the. Uh, uh, southwest part of, of Perth County. As uh, winter progresses, those those squalls typically move more to the to the north, and and uh, usually around <coughs> January. Very correct. Uh, Highway eight seems to be the dividing line, and, and on the radar you, radar you can likely see the snow squalls beating the path right down Highway eight. Um, those do tend to move further north uh, as winter progresses. Um, you know, I guess this is this is just one tool that we can use in in uh, with, with our winter maintenance program. Um, we have discussed a number of other things, and one of them is coming up here right shortly. Well, you're wrong. Uh, just further to that, <laughs> I and and you touched on it that uh, it could relieve some of our uh, liability on this. Um, the concern I would have is that, for example, if the county declares and per South does not, then you're really opening up a can of worms that, uh, well, is the something happens, was the county just looking for a legal uh, liability way out because per South, for example, didn't declare it. And I'm not so sure if, if uh, we shouldn't, uh, be thinking that if the county is going to declare, so should the uh, lower tier municipalities and, co and coordinating with the county, because I'm concerned that uh, that would certainly open up a can of worms. Here you, Warden Aitchison, uh, uh, those are excellent comments, um, and and I and I would agree. And certainly in a decision like this, this is going to be well coordinated, well communicated. Uh, uh, there, there is a section of there where how we communicate the significant weather event and, and what we base it on. So it, there, there is protocol and certainly we work very closely with our member municipalities during the winter time. Um, our, you know, our operations are somewhat intertwined already. Um, and, you know, we, we are in constant conversation if we were to either A, close roads, we're, we're obviously doing that in tandem with our member municipalities and the OPPs and or Stratford Police uh, when it comes to Perth South. Um, so 
you know, when, when we're making these types of decisions, it's not just a county decision. Uh, there would be plenty of conversation with, with the members. And certainly if it's, we, we expect this storm to specifically target one area of the county, um, you know, that's, that's likely going to be stated uh, within the communication. Further questions or comments for John? Lori? Uh, through the warden, so this is a, a solid risk management um, approach to the work to mitigate the exposure uh, that the corporation has uh, should an accident or, or someone wish to pursue um, advancing a claim against a municipality on a road uh, where we've already declared the significant weather event. So I think this change in the legislation comes out of the drive from municipalities um, to the government to say, please do something about the joint several liability, give us a tool we can use. So as we're looking at our work and looking at the strategic plan and trying to align it, one of the strategic plan um, uh, fundamentals is corporate sustainability. And this directly aligns with corporate sustainability because it's about mitigating our exposure, doesn't relieve us from it, but because it allows us to uh, uh, not meet the standards um, and it'll be very well documented and the decision will be made um, as an informed decision from many sources, not, oh, John doesn't want to plow this road today. So it's a, it's a very informed decision, which really um, uh, will work well to be able to put the municipality in a position of defending any action against it or against it. So it's, it's a, um, I know it's only a couple pages to write this, but this is a really uh, excellent um, example of risk mitigation and a tool at our disposal that, um, that we should all take advantage of, in all fairness. Any further comments or questions? I have a motion here. The Perth County Council receives a significant weather event slash Ontario regulation 239 slash 02 report for information and that Perth County Council authorizes the director of public works or designate the authority to declare a significant weather event and that Appendix A of the corporate policy CL-1.06 delegation of powers and duties be amended to include the delegated authority to declare or rescind a significant weather event. Moved by Daryl, seconded by Walter. Last chance for questions or comments. Those in favor, it's carried. Okay, John, climate, can, climate change. Thank you, Nature. Getting her today out there anyway. <laughs> Record. Uh, yes, I guess this is the public work show today. Uh, um, I, I noticed your last council meeting, we didn't have any reports and it only took about a half an hour. So we're glad we can entertain today and, uh, um, and inform. Uh, the next report is an update from our climate change coordinator. And you may have already seen an update at, at the local level there uh, with, with the representatives uh, informing the, their representative councils. So back in 2019, a climate change coordinator was hired for a two year contract to focus on climate change priorities for all seven area municipalities within Perth County. Uh, to date, that coordinator has updated all the municipal energy conservation demand and management plans and has also compiled data on our community greenhouse gas emissions and has developed connections with local stakeholder groups to garner partnerships for future implementation. And, and now it's moving into the final steps of the climate change planning process. Uh, it should be noted that this contract position expires in February of 2021. Uh, further to that, uh, they are using an online platform uh, to do a community survey um, in our and are allowing them to provide the community to provide their input and to vote for actions they support to help reduce our local climate change impacts. Um, that is expected in the very near future. And the results of this survey will help set the priorities of the various possible actions that could be implemented over the next 10 years to reduce local emissions. Um, if I can 
answer any questions, uh, I will try and do so. If not, if I'm not able to, I can ask the climate change report. Okay, questions for John on the climate change report. <coughs> not seeing any. We'll double check on the screen again. I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the climate change coordinator update report for information. Moved by Todd Kassenberg, seconded by Bob Wilhelm. Those in favor? It's carried. Okay, winter maintenance COVID contingency plan. Thank you, Lord Matrison. Um, Again, I had said before that uh, public works leads from the county, the four local municipalities and the town of St. Mary's met in October to discuss the upcoming winter maintenance season. And at the forefront of that meeting was, uh, was the possible impacts that COVID could have on, on our winter maintenance programs. Uh, one of the, some of the things we did discuss in that meeting is uh, prevention. Uh, we, we already do share a number of items within our winter maintenance programs that can be winter materials, loaders, uh, and, and other things. Uh, and we, we certainly recognize that one positive test uh, can have a significant impact on, the, on our response. So prevention is first and foremost, foremost in our minds, um, ensuring that uh, we're all following proper cleaning and disinfecting and, and distancing. Um, we also were questioning uh, the priority testing and availability for COVID tests. Uh, so the CEM, county CEMC played a big part in, in this meeting and was very helpful. Um, so they're looking into and, and hope, hope helping us with, with part of this. We also looked at staffing contingencies within our own operations. Obviously, we're going to look first at inwards uh, to how we can handle such impacts. Uh, the next thing was obviously declaring a significant weather event in, in the minimum maintenance standards, which we just approved, and you will likely see at your local level as well. The next was to reach out to our contractors and our material suppliers just to ensure that they had protocols and contingency plans in place. And certainly with our contractors, did they have the ability to provide any kind of extra support should, uh, should this affect our winter operations? The last thing we discussed was a mutual aid agreement, and that's what this report focuses on. Um, well, the significant weather event allowed, you know, is one tool that we can use with the, our winter uh, program um doesn't uh, really help us uh, if if our uh, if our workforce is impacted by covid and uh, so so one thing that we have looked at is a mutual aid agreement and this uh, mutual aid agreement is in uh, is included with the report um we we don't believe there are any issues with it but it is still with our lawyers for legal review and i just uh, seeking an update there this morning where, where that's at and we expect that to be uh, very very soon. So this is a mutual aid agreement between the county, the four local municipalities and the town of St. Mary's and through this mutual aid agreement it's just uh, allowing support for for any of our public works operations should we be impacted by by COVID or or anything else that that municipality can um, request assistance from, from one or, or a number of other municipalities. That doesn't obligate to any of the other municipalities to provide mutual aid. Um, they can either perhaps I, uh, offer other ideas or um, um, certainly uh, uh, refuse. Um, or you know, per perhaps provide different options. Um, the requesting party will be responsible for all actual operating costs for personnel, services, equipment, or materials furnished. And this agreement further identifies the provisions of mutual aid 
certainly covers off liability and identification, um, insurance, and uh, agreement termination. If there's any questions, uh, you will you will likely we're here today at, um, to get this started at the county. And the idea is, is this would be passed on down to the local municipalities and the town of St. Mary's and everybody signs this agreement. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for John. Bob? I can't let him off that easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the way I interpret this, John, is if COVID, and I'll pick on for myself, if all our staff got sick due to COVID and, and had to uh, uh, stay at home, we could uh, draw on West Perth or, or Perth County, and we would use their equipment, if I'm understanding this correctly. For example, would if West Perth is there plowing Perth South Road, and uh, in, in Perth South, would they be covered by their insurance when they're plowing out of their jurisdiction or vice versa for the county? Through you, Lord, and interesting. And this is one of the reasons why we're just ensuring that we get legal review on this. Uh, this, is, this mutual aid agreement is, is based on uh, current mutual aid agreements that Perth County has with Huron County and with Oxford County as well. So those, those mutual aid agreements were used as a template. So we're fairly sure that this agreement will cover off all those concerns. And I mean, obviously there are certain logistics and certainly with COVID that uh, both municipalities or any municipality that's involved, you know, we need to, we need to further investigate. So whether it's okay to just provide personnel or if we require to provide not only the personnel, but the equipment, those are things that would be sorted out. But uh, the idea with this agreement is to, is to address those liability issues and, and mitigate any risk uh, to, to the municipality that is helping out um, in, in this regard. So uh, yeah, that, that liability would still be reside with that municipality um, and, it, and that doesn't get transferred to the municipality that is that is providing that assistance. Bob? Um, just a comment, excellent report and I'm glad to see your you guys are being proactive to get this looked after before something happens. Okay, one quick, uh, John. Thank you, Warden H. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, uh, certainly Todd McCone, our C County CMC for all his help and certainly Rachel Suffren uh, who, who assists Lori. Um, she, she was instrumental in, in drafting this agreement. So uh, just like to thank them. Uh, obviously this is, um, and certainly all, all the public works uh, staff, this, um, this is a real joint effort and you know, we all work very well together and we realize that this may be a difficult winter season and we're looking for any tools uh, that, that might assist us in, any one of us in, in our operations and certainly maintaining those services that our repairs really need. Any other comments or questions? No, it's a great report, John. I know I talked to you way back in the summertime there one day about this particular matter and I'm glad to see we've actually got it put through and sort of in place before winter maintenance season does start although Sunday was an exception but I told you it was coming anyway um one quick question the legal review so that is done by one lawyer for all ent entities or is it anticipated that the lower tiers of the town of St. Mary's may have their own lawyer peruse this. Uh, through, can I, okay, so through the warden. Um, so we send it to, in, in a situation like this, where you have uh, the lower tiers, if, if you remember an example before was the community transportation agreement, and it came out and said, I just need your consent 
to sign this off. The legal agreement on there, as long as we have at the county level um, consent from uh, the other parties on the page that the uh, one lawyer can review it. It certainly doesn't make sense to have everybody contract a lawyer for the same agreement. Um, you know, St. Mary's may wish to do that because they're not part of the county uh, two tier system. But at the end of the day, certainly the county and the four, munis four local municipalities, we would be looking at that housekeeping item. That's, that's how we're approaching this. This is about corporate sustainability of all parties on here. So it, it doesn't work for the county if uh, in, in a, 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 in a uh, service where we want corporate sustainability for each one of us, if uh, we draft something that has much more advantage to the county force, for example, than one of the partners that we're looking to, to be able to help us. That's just being decent. But I think it might be helpful, um, given Councillor Wilhelm's uh, questions, for us to maybe um, do some specific uh, Q&A, you know, even if it's only a couple questions so that we can share that with the local level public work staff that'll be bringing this forward at the local level to be able to address those types of questions so that nobody's left at the table without, without those types of answers. They're excellent questions. So, and it's about the, ex, it's about mitigating your exposure um, uh, through a risk management tool. The time to do this, as, as you have said, is not when it happens. If, if we get a call at the county, uh, you know, from a, one of our partners, we're gonna respond. The time to have your paperwork in order is always in advance. So, and then that way, if there's training needed on some of the equipment or we need people to be familiar with it, uh, there's good opportunity up to the winter time, up, up to the event uh, that comes where we have to jump into action. The CEMC was, was great to assist with this. Very timely. Okay. Okay. One, yeah, I, and that's great that we're having one because it's no sense reinventing the wheel. No. However, I'm just, the one extra comment I'm gonna add is, we're all basically insured by different insurance companies. Mm -hmm. We're not all with Frank Cowan or whoever. Uh, has there been any discussion with them? Because you know, they interpret things differently amongst themselves as well, as far as covering off. John? Three Ward Natchison, uh, yeah, that's true that we, we all, you know, we don't all have the same insurance provider. And uh, that was one thing, I, certainly from the county perspective, that we did reach out to, to Aon and get their opinion on this as well. So okay. I think their, their response back is uh, um, they were very appreciative of this effort and uh, they weren't aware of any other municipality looking into this. So um, they thought, great, uh, you know, great idea and, and way to go kind of thing. So, uh, I, I think that's uh, the sentiment, certainly from from our insurance provider, um, and, and I certainly from the county's perspective and our provider, I don't have any concerns in that regard. Okay. So I have a motion here: the county council, Perth County Council, receives the winter maintenance COVID contingency plan and mutual aid report for information, and Perth County Council approves the mutual aid agreement between the county for local municipalities and the town of St. Mary's. Moved by Todd Kasenberg, second by Matt Duncan. Last chance for comments or questions. Those in favor, it's carried. Perfect, thanks, John. We you should get to take a break for a second. Okay, moving on. We are at the PC Connect October update. And do we have Maggie coming on? Oh, yes. Oh, there's Maggie. I'm sure we'll be sure to issue. Good morning, everyone. Through the warden, and on behalf of the uh, Justin in the background there. Uh, steering committee, I'd just like to provide a brief update on the Perth County Connect. Uh, so we're thrilled to be launching on November 16th. And we're making a lot of great progress in order to uh, best prepare this service for launch um, in, a, in a few short weeks. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, I just want to confirm that we have secured the required fleet uh, to fully launch both of our routes. 
So Voyago has acquired two buses to launch our service on November 16th. Uh, however, uh, one of the buses will be smaller scale, holding 12 passengers as opposed to 20. Uh, so we have positioned our initial launch uh, to be a soft launch until the permanent fleet arrives uh, and we're able to service our uh, routes with the full 20 passenger fleet. Uh, so during the soft launch phase, uh, gathering route data and rider feedback is a top priority for us. So with two buses, uh, we will be launching both routes on full schedules, um, operating Monday to Saturday for eight hours a day. Uh, the timing and schedules have been tested and approved by Voyago and published to our website. Um, however, the exact timing uh, may change over the next uh, few days or weeks um, as Voyago continues to run and perfect these new routes. So as per the uh, recommendations from the Huron Perth Public Health Unit, uh, the seating on the PC Connect buses will be reduced 50% in order to enable um, and encourage safe physical distancing. In addition to every other seat being blocked off, passengers who are able will be required to wear a face covering. Hand sanitizer and branding masks will be available on board and official COVID-19 uh, prevention signage uh, will be posted throughout all of the buses. So we are offering uh, both PC routes A and B uh, for $6 a ride for adults and $5 a ride for seniors and students. During the soft launch, we will be offering these fares at 50% off as a promotional um, effort to encourage and increase ridership. As an entirely new service, we really want to make this as, a, as appealing as possible for residents to go out, jump on the bus and experience um, exactly what the PC Connect has to offer. So booking the service uh, can be done in three easy steps for residents. Um, these are also um, advertised on our website and all of the marketing material that we'll be pushing out. Uh, so riders will be required to call the toll-free number uh, to book the ride the day before their trip, provide their details um, of their trip, such as the day, the time, their pickup and their destination, and show up five minutes before the scheduled pickup time uh, with the exact change for their fare. So it is important to note that all reservations will take priority over riders at a bus stop who haven't pre-booked the service. Uh, so the website has been updated and will be the platform that hosts all of the most up-to-date information uh, of the service. In addition to the website, uh, there will also be a toll-free number that is managed by Voyago uh, that will be available uh, starting Monday for residents to call to inquire about the service and as well to book the service. Uh, in terms of marketing, we have started a marketing campaign and we'll begin to heavily market uh, the PC Connect within the next few days, weeks, and months into the service. Uh, we have a series of radio ads that are currently ad, um, airing Sorry, uh, with the Perth County's local radio station, 100.1 The Ranch. Um, a media release will be distributed um, as soon as possible, hopefully later this afternoon. Um, and a public notice will be submitted to all of our local papers. Uh, so we'll also be leveraging municipal newsletters to inform residents of this new service. Um, all muni member municipalities and stakeholders such as our BIAs uh, will be provided with a media kit within the next few days uh, that will include a series of social media posts and captions with guidelines and collateral to promote the PC Connect. In addition to content being pushed out through our own accounts and our stakeholders accounts, we are running a series of promoted ads that will target residents throughout the county and surrounding areas. The content for these promoted ads are currently uh, being created and will start running heavily um, early next week. Another marketing channel that we are leveraging is direct mail. So all residents uh, within the county, um, Stratford and St. Mary's will receive a postcard that includes key information on the service, uh, such as routes and how to book. Um, and in addition to the postcards, uh, posters are being developed and will be distributed throughout the county in areas such as the town office, rec centers, and grocery stores. Outreach will continue uh, with local senior organizations, uh, church groups, and large manufacturers throughout the, the county. So we are confident that we've developed a big and strong multimedia marketing campaign, and we're hopeful that it'll be effective in acquiring PC Connect ridership um, within the next few weeks. Um, in terms of ribbon cutting, we uh, do plan to host a joint event with the City of Stratford on Tuesday, November the 24th at 1 p.m. 
Uh, stay tuned for an official invitation within the next few days. Uh, the MP and MPP have been invited to attend the event uh, as well as the Minister and Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, select media will also be invited to this event, um, however, keeping um, gathering restrictions top of mind. Uh, so the first few weeks of operation, we're also positioning this as a feedback week for all of our key stakeholders. Um, so we're inviting everyone, including council, uh, to come out and ride the PC Connect for free of cost um, and to provide their feedback and experience on their ride. Um, so official invitations and free ride coupons uh, for the feedback week as well will be distributed as soon as possible. Uh, so that does conclude my brief update um, on the PC Connect. I'm certainly thrilled to be launching um, in a few short weeks, and um, I can answer any questions that anyone may have regarding the service. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Questions for Maggie from anyone? Walter. Uh, um, this doesn't have to do with your report, Maggie, but an uh, update. Um, I'm just wondering if you have heard any feedback from other... Sorry, uh, one second here. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear Walter? Oh, now we can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, just, just, Quiet, wondering, but... just wondering if you have had any feedback from other areas that have launched the, um, the transportation system, uh, what the uptake is from the residents. We're just getting our speakers figured out here. Sorry about that. Um, so through the warden, uh, I was actually able to um, sit in on one of the SCT um, which is the Southwest Community Transportation Committee uh, meetings earlier this week. So everyone shared their feedback. Um, there has been a large um, variety of uptake on services. Um, some of the longer runs have seen a great uptake. Um, I don't have the numbers quite on hand, but I think there had been about 300 riders um, for the month um, for Tilsonburg. And then uh, some of the smaller um, uh, routes had experienced a bit of slower uptake, um, but they're working um, to increase their marketing on those um, to get that uptake. But uh, there are some services that are running at full capacity right now um, and others a bit slower uptake. So there's a large scale there. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Right. Pounds right. Ooh, hello, Maggie. Um, when we started this project, it seems like three years ago, we had talked about how to get people to the bus stops. We, we looked at, did we look at subsidizing taxi cabs and whatnot to get them to the, the, the say you're in, you're at Wood and you live seven miles away. Did we, did we ever figure anything to get them there to help out? Through the warden, uh, we're still working on solving the first and last mile um, challenge that may be faced. Um, we had discussed um, subsidizing taxi um, coupons or rides as you, as you spoke to. So we're gonna continue to investigate that and see if uh, that fits in the, the MTO guidelines of our spending. But, uh, that is certainly top of mind for us um, to figure out through this soft launch and hopefully get that implemented uh, as soon as possible. Other questions? Rhonda? When we had council on Tuesday night, one of our counselors asked why the bus route was not going through Shakespeare. Uh, maybe you can just refresh us of why, uh, why the routes are where they are. Sure, so through the warden, uh, the initial route consultation was completed uh, before my involvement. However, it is my understanding that uh, Shakespeare wasn't included in our initial two routes uh, because Stratford does have a route that goes through uh, Shakespeare and would be providing that connection. So one of Stratford's runs does travel from Waterloo um, through Shakespeare to Stratford and St. Mary's. Um, so they will be um, investigating a potential stop or um, in Shakespeare for their full launch. Um, so that is where that connectivity with Shakespeare fits into the project. Um, and also just another thing to note um, is that we have implemented a very customer um, centric strategy for the soft launch. Um, so we will be focusing on gathering um, as much uh, feedback and rider data and data as possible. Um, so we can certainly look into altering one of the PC connect or one of our Perth County routes uh, to directly stop in Shakespeare um, if that demand is proven. 
Okay, thank you. Bob? Uh, uh, I'm glad to see this finally coming to fruition and, and uh, it seems like it's been going on forever. And I congratulate you on your uh, advertising and such like campaign because it's certainly needed that uh, residents that I spoke with herself had no knowledge of any uh, bus route or buses coming into effect in the county. And uh, with the soft launch, I was in favor of that because we we're only gonna have one bus. But now that we have two buses, I would rather see full launch and uh, let's get the word out there as much as we can and uh, uh, move forward with that. Because I think in January, it's kind of late to do it. Comments, Maggie? Thank, uh, through the warden, thank you for those comments. Um, I think just the um, thing to clarify on the soft launch is just that we're positioning that um, as an introduction to the service, we're running the full route. Um, however, we are offering 50% on that soft launch and we're just really focusing on gathering feedback so that we can make any changes required for that full launch when we receive the full buses, um, hopefully in January. Um, so yeah, we are hoping to get a full marketing campaign out within the next few days and heavily market um, everything, just as if we would if it was a full service with the full buses. Other comments or questions? I'm not on Facebook, but I've had people tell me lately that on Facebook, this actually in the last few days has become more of a discussion period on Facebook. So it, it must actually starting to be getting out there. Again, you're getting close to the launch date, so I'm anticipating that's why. Anyway, uh, anything else there, Maggie? That is all for me. Thanks so much. Okay, I have a motion that Perth County Council receives the PC Connect slash October update report for information. Moved by. Walter, second by Rhonda. Those in favor, it's carried. Perfect, thanks, Maggie. Justin? Thank you. Okay, we have some bylaws to do. Uh, first would be in a bylaw 3777-2020, be read at first, second, and third time, and finally passed this fifth day of November, 2000. And 20. Moved by Bob, Councillor Wilhelm, second by Councillor McDermott. Those in favor? It's carried. Um, we have bylaw 3778 2020 be read at first, second, and third time and finally passed this fifth day of November 2020. Moved by <coughs> Walter. Second by Rhonda. Those in favor? It's carried. Okay. We are ready. Okay. Well, first we will do uh, notice of motions. Todd? Just get myself here off mute. Thank you. Uh, Council, I intend to introduce a motion at uh, our next meeting uh, that uh, reads similar to what I'm about to read. Uh, here's, here's the text that uh, at the present time reflects the thinking. Uh, Whereas Perth County is a welcoming home to a tolerant, respectful community that celebrates diversity and promotes inclusivity, both in our organization and for all residents, businesses, and organizations, and whereas Perth County eschews race, racism and works to stop it when encountered, therefore be it resolved that the County of Perth establishes a committee on inclusion and diversity to explore and identify relevant actions that represent this County's commitment to a tolerant, respectful community, and that potential actions to be considered by the committee include the creation of an inclusivity and anti-racism charter or statement, exploration of the option to join the coalition of inclusive municipalities, petitioning other levels of government for actions conducive to our intentions, and other actions viewed as viable to further the commitment. 
to a tolerant, respectful community, and that the county of the council of the county of Perth approve an associated terms of reference to support the work of the committee, and that the committee deliver its first report to council no later than February 28th, 2021. Okay, thanks, Todd. So we don't have to receive that. We're no. just, that just, no. just is a no. notice of motion. Okay, any other notice of motions? Well, actually, you would have had to have had it before today anyway, right? Yeah, we were aware of that. Yep. Okay, uh, moving on. Other business. Not seeing any hands go up. Announcements. So before we go into closed session, uh, this is the meeting where you normally would state your intent if you want to run for warden. And I think we're gonna do that under announcements before we go into closed session. So anybody who wishes to state, the, I can go around the room here and on the screen, anybody who wants to run for warden, I will ask if you intend to do that. Walter? I don't think so. <laughs> Daryl? No, thank you. Doug? No, thank you and have supported who has already submitted. You? Uh, no, thank you. Todd? Uh, no, thanks. Doug? Not this year. Rhonda? Not this year, no thanks. Bob? I think we've got an excellent person in charge right now and has put his name forward, so I will pass. Them. Oh, come on. Well, I just said I intended to. I haven't put it forward yet. Today's the official day. Yeah, today's the official day. Yeah, so I don't, Matt must have went snuck out to the washroom, so I just can't not give him the opportunity. But in the meantime, I do intend to take this position on for another year. And I know Councillor Wilhelm and I talked about it the other night or one day in the last week or two. And Paul Bob said to me, how'd you like to have been the mayor and the warden this year? And I said, I'll be honest with you. I don't think I could have done it. We have had so many extra pivots and derivatives and whatnot because of COVID and different things. Like yes, I said, Bob, you just keep around the township and I'll try and do this job. And I'll be honest with you, some days I struggle to keep up. Some days I'm getting a hundred emails and phone calls and it's just, well, you were at my place one day and the phone never stopped ringing. Again, it has been a challenge, I'm not gonna lie. I've enjoyed it. I'm actually hoping that perhaps next year it might be a little more normal, but I honestly don't anticipate that based on all the numbers. And, and even though some of the areas are going back to stage two, I saw yesterday they had three and 350 cases. I'm thinking, wow. They kind of just threw those guidelines out the window. Anyway, I just need Matt to come back and then we can move on. But and then what about deputy? Oh, so deputy warden, can we state intent for that for the, at this meeting? You, you can't through the warden. You can because we have to do the the election. We have to do the voting a little different because we're hybrid. So it's it's easier for. I mean, obviously, it's easier for us if it's prepared. If we can do that, and I know Tyler's been working on the logistics of how we're actually going to do the voting if there is a vote for that. So, so the one thing we have discussed to some small degree is how, like usually when you have your new ward and you have all your ceremony and everything else, I said, well, that's not gonna happen because you can't. If you wanna go out and rent a huge facility like the Art of Clark again or something, but I'm thinking we'll do, we'll do with this. So, uh, well, you were just out the door there, Matt. We were going around the room, and uh, anyone who had the intentions to run for warden had their chance to do it. And I'm just waiting for your answer now. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I did tell them that I do intend to do it for one more year. So I guess I know. Maybe. Okay, Deputy Warden. We're going to deal with that one right now. Walter. No, I don't think so. But uh, advice to Laurie is. Uh, if you have to count ballots, uh, please don't take any indication from the last time. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got my lawyer on speed dial. <laughs> Daryl. Uh, no, thank you. Doug. No, thank you. I think consistency is there and uh, she's done a good job. You. Uh, again, no, thank you. Todd. 
Uh, no, thanks. No, thanks. Doug. No, thanks. No, thanks. Matt. No. Nope. Rhonda. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I can't promise that I'll be warden the next year. That's the only thing. Well, you don't have to at this point in time. Like, I will let my name stand, but I cannot promise that I will step up to work. Because as you just alluded, I... You can't do both, I don't think, with what's going on. Be mayor and the warden is just too much. Well, it's been a handful. Yeah, and I have enough on my plate now in my own personal life as well. But I, you know, I would. We're just, you know, I'm just worrying about deputy ward at this point yeah. in time. But usually the progression is you go deputy to ward. Yeah, right? well, that doesn't but always happen. I just happen, want to make but... that clear. So. Okay, so you're willing to be the deputy warden? Mm -hmm. No, thanks. No, okay, so I guess uh, Rhonda will be the deputy warden. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, any other announcements? So we are going to move into closed session, so I need a motion to go into closed session at <coughs> right here, 1031. Moved by Todd, seconded by Bob Wilhelm. Those in favor? Gary, we're going to take a five minute break because we have to readjust the feed and whatnot. So, anybody that wants to go to the washroom or whatever, now is the perfect opportunity. Yeah, we have to go back live to finish this off. We're recording now. And then we're good. And then we'll post on YouTube once we're posting. Okay. So I have a bylaw 3779 2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Perth at its regular meeting held November 5th, 2020, is read a first, second, and third time and finally passed November 5th, 2020. Moved by. Rhonda, seconded by Daryl. Those in favor? Gary. And I have a motion that the council meeting adjourn at 11.05. Moved by Councillor Wilhelm, second by Councillor McKenzie. Those in favor? Gary. Thank you very much. Yeah,